folks logging in. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mimi Enright. I'm the program coordinator for the UC Master Gardener program in Sonoma County <clears throat> and one of the founding members of the Resilient Landscapes Coalition, which you'll be hearing more about tonight from our presenter. Uh, welcome to our Fall Landscape Maintenance in the Defensible Space uh, workshop. This is a webinar, so uh, we are in webinar format, so your video and your mic are inactive. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we put all of our uh, webinars, uh, recorded webinars up on YouTube for folks to access after the fact of the workshop. And we do ask that you put any questions you have to, uh, during uh, Jennifer's presentation tonight in the Q&A box, um, not the chat. It's much easier for us to just manage that in one location in the Q&A function. All right, so I'm going to, I'm happy to introduce our speaker for tonight, Jennifer Roberts, uh, who is a UC Master Gardener, and she's also uh, been uh, working with us on our uh, Resilient Landscapes Coalition workshops, uh, which are currently being funded uh, by County of Sonoma Vegetation Management Funds. Uh, Jennifer has extensive experience, uh, she's a master composter, uh, she has extensive experience working and educating in this space, as well as the composting space, amongst many others. Uh, and we are uh, very pleased to have her presenting uh, for us tonight. So, Jen, I'm going to turn it on over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Mimi. And thank you to everyone who is joining us tonight. So today we're going to talk about landscape maintenance in the defensible space with a, a bent towards the fall season. Today definitely does not feel like fall, but it's coming and we wanna be prepared and know what to do in our garden to help uh, create defensible space. So uh, the Resilient Landscapes Coalition is made up of four nonprofits, including FireSafe Sonoma, where we have Roberta McIntyre and Marika Ramston as part of our team, Habit the Habitat Corridor Project, with April Owens, the Sonoma Ecology Center with Ellie Inslee and John Kennedy, and the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County with Mimi Enright and myself, Jennifer Roberts. And like Mimi said, we're in partnership with the County of Sonoma Fire Prevention Division. And this is our website, but don't worry, it will appear many times and you'll be able to get that down. All right, so. Here's what we're gonna talk about tonight. First, we're going to look at what is defensible space? What does that even mean? And then I'll cover maintenance practices for overall plant health in the fall. We'll look at pruning, mowing, mulching, irrigation, and composting. And then we'll look at maintenance practices in the defensible space zone. So a little bit more detail about related to each zone, what can we do? And we'll have some final thoughts on sustainable landscape management practices related to energy, soil, and habitat. And I'll have a few resources to share with you. And then we have ample time for questions with a wonderful panel that has very much expertise. All right. So when we talk about fire, we talk about three things that create that fire. So this is called the fire behavior triangle. And this is made up of weather, topography, and fuel. And the weather being wind, temperature, humidity, and precipitation. Topography being the slope of the land. And fuel being the amount arrangement and moisture level. Now, when we look at this, we can control only one part of this triangle, right? We can't control the weather, we can't control the topography, but we can control fuel. So keep this in mind as we talk tonight about maintenance in our landscape. So fire behavior can occur in three different ways. The first one is embers. So when there is a fire happening, there's lots of embers being flying around. And as fires can be very extreme, then they can create their own weather with high winds. So embers are a huge concern. The next way fire can 
take over buildings and forests, et cetera, is through radiant heat. So if one thing is on fire, the heat can be so great that things next to it can then light on fire as well. And the fire goes on and on that way. The last way fire can behave is with direct flame. So this is that wall of flame coming at an entity. But the most destructive thing in a fire or what causes the majority of structure fires is embers. So this is what we have to be very concerned about. And when we talk about fire and protecting ourselves, protecting our home, we say that the first step is to harden our home and then work from there into the landscape. So that's an important concept. There are specific things you can do to harden your home, um, but I'm not gonna cover that tonight. I'm just gonna focus on the outside landscape, but I encourage you to look more into that if you're not quite sure exactly what I'm talking about. So what is defensible space? It's the area around your home from zero feet to 100 feet. So thinking about up to 100 feet away from your home and any outlying structures that may be on your property. So we split defensible space into three zones. The first one we call zone zero and that's zero feet to five feet away from the structure. And again, any structure on the property. And we call that the ember defense zone. So this is the space that we wanna create where if embers land there, they're not gonna ignite and not create more of a problem, cause more fire. Zone one is five feet to 30 feet out from your structures. And we call this the lean, clean, and green zone. So we, there's different parameters for what we can include in each zone. We'll talk about that. Zone two is 30 feet to 100 feet out from your structures. And this is the reduced fuel zone. So a little more about these different zones. In that first zone, it's the areas closest to the home and structures, and that includes fences, decks, outbuildings, anything that extends and is built. And we want to have minimal plants and minimal combustible material in that zone. And we, if we are choosing to use a mulch, it's best to use a non-organic mulch. And what I mean by that is something that cannot combust. Next, in the next zone, the five to 30 foot zone, we can have groupings of plantings separated by non-combustible pathways. And these separations can be made of many materials and we'll talk about that. And it can also include irrigated native grass in this zone. And then the last zone, the 30 to 100, the reduced fuel zone, is where you can have larger groupings of plants and more trees. So as you move further away from the home, you can have more greenery, more material. But we'll talk about that more. So when determining and thinking about creating defensible space on your property, your first step is to think about your personal risk assessment. So land, uh, Sonoma County is a vast county. We have many different landscapes. I think we have 35 different uh, recognized microclimates just in our county. So, you know, someone who's living in Sebastopol ha might have a different risk than someone in Cloverdale or someone who's on a big slope, et cetera, et cetera. So each home and landscape is unique and we have to consider them individually. So we suggest, first of all, walking your property and observing your garden through the seasons. You know best, you see what happens, right? Do you, do you get extreme winds every afternoon in the summer? 
or do you get extreme rainfall for Sonoma County? Do you see pollinators in your garden? Do you have uh, larger critters that come to visit? Are you uh, next to wildlands or a creek? Right? These are all things that are gonna help determine how you set up your defensible space. And the other thing to consider is your maintenance needs and also how much maintenance in your landscape you're willing to do. And that doesn't have to be you personally, right? This can be hired out, but just thinking that each thing that if we're doing new plantings, they need maintenance. If we have established plantings, they need maintenance. So thinking about your personal needs. And through this talk and any of the work that we do, we're never recommending creating a moonscape in your land. So meaning coming in and tearing out everything that's alive and just replacing it with rock and gravel. We would never suggest that. There are ways to live with plants, have a beautiful landscape, create habitat, and still be fire safe and fire wise. So one important concept to always keep in mind when designing or putting in new plants or taking out old plants is, is this the right plant in the right place? So is, for example, on the left here, this tree was planted really close to this building. And so therefore it's leaning heavily. It's not been able to reach its full potential. The leaning can um, be a hazard later on. So this is a problem that wasn't addressed many years ago. This wasn't put in the right place and then it wasn't maintained properly. So we could have problems down the road. Whereas over here, these plants have plenty of space to grow to their full potential and have area for us to come in and do good maintenance. So proper maintenance of our outdoor landscape is important for the reduction of fire hazard and good design allows for easy maintenance. So let's talk about fall in Sonoma County. We turn from a very hot and dry part of the year, the driest part, where we can potentially have very dry winds, sometimes called Diablo winds, down south called the Santa Ana winds. And we, it seems like our summer just dr draws out and then you get that day where the temperatures drop and it, then it starts to feel like fall. And then we hopefully get into our first rain. And our rain season typically starts in October, but we all know it's been a bit of a roller coaster with that. Um, as far as what plants are doing in fall, there is some growth, there's seed germination, and when the rains do come, roots are starting to grow. What is blooming at this time? For example, we have California goldenrod, California fuchsias, coast aster, coyote bush, and buckwheats, certain kinds. And perhaps one of the most exciting thing for any gardener is that fall is for planting. This is the best time for us to plant or is in our summer dry climate that we have here. So, put the plants in, the rains come, the soil is getting wet. It's just, it's a perfect time for planting. So let's look at the maintenance practices that we can do that generate plant health and as a result, help us keep better defensible space and be more ready for fire. So we're gonna talk about pruning, mowing, irrigation, mulching, and composting. And maintenance is not just a one-time thing. There is regular maintenance we need to do in our landscape. There's annual maintenance, and there's long-term maintenance, thinking on the more one to three year time frame. So we're start with pruning, the basics. So pruning is both an art and a science. There are specific ways to prune and there are best practices, but there also is a sense of 
artistic flair or just seeing how a plant looks and how it could be enhanced through pruning. I think one of the best ways to, um, best examples of that is the practice of bonsai. That's an extreme case, but pruning is art and science. So we prune plants for vigor and health and safety, both for the plant and for us in our communities. And when we prune, we want to be maintaining the integrity and balance of plants. So we don't want things, you know, getting to one side or lopsided. We want to think of the whole plant, whether it's tree or shrub, we're taking everything into consideration. And when we prune, we're always looking for anything that is dead, dying, diseased, or crossing. You know, if you see a very, you know, lush bush or tree, there can be a lot of things that are crossing and those can rub against each other and create wounds. So part of our caretaking for our plants is reducing these four things. So we want to come in first and take care of any problems that we might see and then go from there. And when we prune, we always wanna work with clean and sharp cutting tools. This is because when we prune, we are generating a wound in the plant and we wanna make sure it's a good cut and that we're not introducing any harmful fungi or bacteria with our tools. So if you are doing uh, your whole landscape at one time, it's best practices to clean your tools in between plants at a minimum, and definitely if you're working with any visible diseased plant. And when you prune, you want to go slow, step back, and ask, why am I making each cut? So for late fall, or late summer and fall pruning, we are looking to do rejuvenation of the plants after a long season where they you know, been in the sun and then it's coming to a new time where we're going to get those rains. And we want to look to shape our plants after they're done flowering. So wait till they're, the flowers have died. And the, there are certain plants that take pruning in this time, some of our favorite natives in California. So those include toyon, coffee berry, coyote brush, ceanothus, and manzanita, and then semi-evergreen perennials that also can take pruning at this time are matilaha poppy, monkey flower, goldenrod, and sages. Pruning for fire safety. So our goals with this, in addition to everything we just talked about, we wanna look at our plants in terms of horizontal spacing and vertical spacing. So what we wanna be creating space between groupings of plants and also from structures. We also wanna, we are very concerned with removing any dead material. So it doesn't necessarily mean that entire branches have died, but you see here, this is seed pods. So we want to, you know, after we have seed pods and spent flowers, we want to come in and remove these as they could be a fire hazard. We also want to think about thinning plants rather than hedging them. So thinning plants is coming in and making select cuts that open up the canopy or open up the shrub Whereas hedging, we, we're taking dense plantings together and kind of making them look like one thing. You, know, you can see a whole wall of a hedge. And often when we uh, prune those, they're done by shearing. So coming in with a shearing tool down the side. And when we do this, all the young growth is on the outside, but that inside is becoming incredibly woody and dense. And if we have embers flying about, this is the spot where if they land, this will, it can ignite and become a big problem. 
And also remember, we're, we're pruning to rejuvenate plants, also in a situation like this. Another thing we wanna do when we're pruning or observing our landscape is we wanna eliminate what's called fuel laddering. So if you see this, there are plants on the ground, and if there's a fire moving through on the ground level, these plants can ignite. If they're very tall and close enough where that flame can reach the canopy of the tree, now we have a bigger problem if that tree ignites. This is a different type of fire now, much harder to put out and control. So we wanna eliminate fuel ladders by keeping the distance from lower plants to the tree canopy three times the understory height. I'll give you a real world example here. So one of our coalition members identified that this is a ladder fuel potential problem. So coming in and pruning back this juniper, allowing to the space here and the space here. So this photo also illustrates this concept of vertical and horizontal spacing that we always want to be mindful of when creating defensible space. And this is another look at this juniper that was pruned. Juniper is prone to getting woody inside and a lot of dead, dense material. So this is another example where we want to come in and clean that out. And the bush is still alive, it's fine, but we're just taking all that dead material. Another thing we want to do is eliminate vines from trees or structures. So this is another ladder fuel event that can happen. So we want to get rid of this. Now talking about pruning spacing. So fire travels faster uphill. So we want to maintain spacing between groups of plants on flat or gently sloped sites, shrubs should be spaced two times the height of the shrub. So if we have slope, we need more space between plants. So clusters of trees should be 10 feet apart on less than 20% slopes, and clusters of trees should be 20 feet apart on more than 20% slopes. So the more slope you have, it's ideal to have clusters of trees spaced further apart. Now this is, you know, perfect world idea. This is not always possible, but there are other ways to, you know, reduce ladder fueling that can be a protective method. Pruning shrubs. There are herbaceous perennials, which are non-woody shrubs. And then when we generally say shrubs, these are things that are more woody. So like this example again. And we wanna make sure that we're moving anything diseased or dead. And we can do this any time of the year. If you see it, get it out of there. But every two to three years, it's a good idea to reduce old woody growth as you see it. And one example you know, we have everywhere in Sonoma County is lavender. That lavender does have a lifespan and it does get very dense and woody inside. So this is something we should be going in and clearing out. Other pruning techniques, selective pruning and thinning. So this is very important. I mentioned it before. But this is where we come in and we are selectively taking out certain branches or small twigs that are making the canopy of a tree quite dense. Or maybe a lot of this is actually dead. So that's choosing what we're cutting. And this helps control the size and shape of a tree without coming in and just taking a huge portion off. Because pruning can, you know, it is creating a wound, right? So it can be a shock for a tree or any plant. So we don't want to do a lot at once. We want to be selective. And even with shrubs, it can be beneficial to, we say, limb up a large shrub. 
So if they have a lot of low branches, you can create some shrubs to look more of a tree form and you're creating more of that vertical space. When pruning trees, we have a couple of recommendations. So you should consult a licensed arborist as needed. So if you have very large or um, old or even maybe possibly heritage trees, you should definitely talk with a professional before coming in and doing any removal or major pruning. And you should never prune trees that are near electric lines yourself. Do not do that. Uh, we also recommend that you remove lower limbs of trees to six feet up from the ground or one third of the height of the tree if it's more than 30 feet tall. Again, avoiding the fuel ladders and county code requires at least 10 feet of distance of branches from chimneys or stove pipes. So maintaining that distance. When pruning trees, timing is important for vigor and growth. So we can't just do it all at the same time. It depends on the type of the tree and your goal. So fruit trees are often pruned in the dormant season, which for them is winter, but not all fruit trees are like that. Evergreen trees, we prune in early spring or midsummer. Pines, we prune in December and January. Evergreen oaks, like the coast live oak, is dormant July, August, and potentially through October. So that's when we would do pruning. And deciduous oaks are dormant in winter. So we prune then. And trees may overhang a roof but we wanna keep a clearance of at least six feet. And it's very important to maintain leaf litter year round. So this redwood and, and pines and a lot of trees we love drop a lot of leaf litter over time. So especially in fall, this late summer, fall time, we need to be very vigilant about cleaning off roofs and gutters. And we don't want to top our trees. So you can see this tree has just been locked off right there. It's not healthy for the tree. It can even kill it or it's very stressful. So it can encourage uh, disease or insects to come. Uh, this is another example of a type of topping where this tree reacts very suddenly to this, pushes a lot of weak new growth and then this can also be attractive to insects or disease. So it's not a good idea. Instead, we thin and we think about integrity and balance of trees in their natural form. A couple more pruning techniques. Deadheading is a common one. And this is just where we remove a spent flower head from a shrub or flowering plant. And we, this encourages a rebloom, depending on what kind of plant it is. You might get a secondary bloom if you do this. Uh, and if, for example, in penstemon and monkey flowers. And it is important to leave some spent flowers for reseeding and for wildlife. We, if we plant native plants, one of our goals is to create habitat, create food, for all the wildlife that lives around. And so many birds and other insects depend on seed. And here is that thinning technique, another example of selectively taking out branches. We can also cut back some plants very hard. This can be very rejuvenating, especially if we've got a lot of dry, woody material. Uh, one great example that responds quite well is coyote brush. This is an example. So they can, they can get very woody and very tall. So you can really cut it hard, which even can be called coppicing. If you really cut it right at the base, it'll push that new growth and come back and 
you can even change a, the form of the plant through this technique. When we prune, we wanna make sure we are cutting above a bud. So that's a bud where if you look at the, the stick part, the brown part generally, or well, it could be green too, but where it's going to push a bud, you wanna cut above that because you wanna let that bud live on. That'll be your next branch or flower. And you wanna cut to a lateral branch and avoid cutting the branch collar, which is, uh, oh, I don't have a good picture of this, but like on a tree where it's attached, you don't wanna, and there's kind of like a wrinkly part, you don't wanna cut into that. And you wanna make sure you make flush, good cuts. We don't wanna leave stubs because then we can get death or dieback or push weak growth. And we don't need to use wound dressings. They're not necessary and might be detrimental. Okay, so that was pruning. Now we're gonna talk about mowing. So when we mow, we only wanna use a mower before 10 a.m. when we have dry, hot weather. And not at all if it's windy or excessively hot and dry, like on a red flag warning day. Uh, hot engines can ignite dry grass, so we need to be very careful. And we should have a water supply and a fire extinguisher close at hand. Um, and if we're mowing in the spring, we definitely wanna survey for birds and avoid areas where they're nesting. So again, that's that walking your property at least once a season and assessing before you come in with any kind of tools. When we mow, we, our goal is to stay ahead of weeds and prevent the seed formation of these weeds. Each one of these little bud or um, seeds on this grass and here can become a whole other plant. So if we let weeds go to seed, we keep perpetuating their life cycle and the problem with them. So we wanna make sure we're removing invasive and high risk plants and mow or trim grass and weeds to four inches in the spring and summer and six inches next to roadways. So as we move into fall, uh, if we've kept up on our mowing, things start to die back and we don't have a, as much of a regimen of mowing, but we do wanna be mindful of creating a landscape where it's just uh, a lot of dust, where things are so dead that we just have you know, bare soil everywhere that could be blowing or losing our soil. So it's a delicate balance, but that's why we wanna come in if we have you know, a weedy area and plant good plants, right? Plant natives. Uh, if you have a lawn, you can leave your grass clippings on your lawn as mulch. This is called grass cycling. And it's a way to keep nutrients on your lawn and you have to add less fertilizer, et cetera. Um, it provides nutrients and it helps retain the soil moisture and keeps green waste out of a landfill. I hope if you do mow and you are collecting it, that you are putting it in a compost pile or in a green bin, which gets taken to be composted. Uh, if you, a string trimmer, is a great idea because it presents less risk than a mower for starting a fire. And it's a good idea to consider electric machines. So now mulching. So mulching it, or mulch is anything that covers the soil and it can be organic or inorganic. So once alive, organic or inorganic, not, was not alive. So examples of mulch are wood chips, also called arbor mulch, stones, gravel, straw, coconut fiber, leaf litter, grass trimmings, and compost. And there are benefits to using mulch. These include water conservation, preventing soil compaction, preventing erosion, reducing dust, like I was talking about before, suppressing weeds, visually enhancing our landscape, and potentially cooling the soil, depending on which of these you choose. 
Organic mulches such as wood chips, straw, and leaf litter also improve the soil tilth and feed soil life. So they are a great choice where appropriate. So I mentioned arbor mulch, and that is probably the most common type of mulch that we use. And in a study of eight types of mulch that was done in 2008 by the University of California and the University of Nevada, they tested these eight mulches and arbor mulch or composted wood chips, these, produced very little flame and had the slowest rate of fire spread. So this mulch should be applied two to three inches deep and you wanna use larger pieces, not teeny, teeny, tiny ones, because it has a low burn rate, but it may smolder in the presence of embers. But this was the best one. And when we say composted wood chips, these are wood chips that have been through the composting process. So they're not fresh chips. They have sat out and been turned. And we can talk more about that later especially if you have questions about that. Um, when we talk about defensible space and mulching, we want to use a non-combustible, non-organic material as mulch within five feet of our house. So anything like stone, gravel, brick, pavers, or concrete, are all good materials to use in that first five feet zone that we talked about. So our goal is to have as little organic material or combustible material or five feet around our home or outbuildings. And this includes fences, garages, et cetera. And one way to do that, this type of design, you can have two inches of base rock compacted well and then put one to two inches of three quarter inch pebble on top. Just one example. But then moving outward after that five feet, then we can use arbor mulch. And we would, we'll do that by breaking it up with non-combustible materials. So we can use um, the same kinds of things, stone, we can, walls are considered a break, gravel, flagstone, pavers, et cetera. So in this five to 30 foot zone, we were creating islands of planting and we can use mulch, but we're using non-combustibles to separate these islands. We want to avoid this type of mulch. This is sometimes called gorilla hair, or angel hair mulch, and it's fine shredded redwood or cedar. And this is a picture from Fire Safe Marin of it igniting. So this is not the best choice of mulch to use. We also don't recommend shredded rubber, pine needles, or the shredded bark because it has the highest hazardous combustion characteristics, so it's not recommended. Leaf litter is also a type of mulch, and it's important for nutrients to get back into our soil through the composting process. So leaf litter breaks down over the seasons, but when, we're, when it's dry, uh, dry out, like especially in this late summer, early fall time, excess dead leaves can be removed and composted. So you wanna always be assessing your risk. For fire. But if we're about to get the rains, they're right around the corner, then you can keep more leaf litter down. And then that for the rest of the season, you can keep the leaf litter. It will break down quicker once we get the rains coming and that's feeding the soil or the trees that it came from. Nature's natural process. Irrigated native grasses, which you see here, can be a wonderful alternative to a regular lawn and they're okay in the five, zero to five foot zone and the five to 30 foot zone. All right, let's talk irrigation. 
So proper irrigation will keep plants hydrated and less flammable. But we want to avoid excess watering. Of course, we want to conserve water, but we also want to prevent excessive growth of plants that we then have to come back in and thin or remove, right? We're creating more work for ourselves, but also potentially stressing the plant. And if we water too much, that can kill plants, especially natives. Native plants to California are expecting to not have water in the summer months. So we don't wanna overwater. And it's best idea to get to know your irrigation system, know how to turn it off and on, how to set it, and most importantly, how to make changes throughout the seasons. So, you know, we could go from it being very hot one week to boom, we're into the cool temperatures, the rains are coming. So the amount you of irrigation you need in July is very different than what you need in late November. So you need to know how to make those changes. And you should know how to spot leaks in your system, whether that's through sight or listening for breaks in pipes or breaks in emitters. And there is technology that allows adjusted irrigation based on the soil's moisture and weather conditions, specifically for where you live. So it can be pretty foolproof if you have your system set up correctly from the get-go. So the best tip is to know your plants. Get to know what you have, or if you're bringing in new plants, get to know their water use, you know, what they need, their thirstiness. And this is going to be determined by a few things, including sun exposure, the slope, how much wind you get, what species of plant we're talking about, what season it is, and how mature your plant is. So there is this handy guide, it's called WUCLES, which stands for Water Use Classification of Landscape Species. And they have gone through and determined, you know, many, many common plants, what types of water use they all have. So is this plant considered a high water use, moderate, low, or very low? So if you want to put in a drought tolerant garden, then you wanna be working with low and very low plants. Uh, it's a great idea. Everyone should be thinking about water usage here in California. So this is a great site to get started. And I said natives are adapted to our summer dry climate, but newly planted natives need a little bit more water. So natives can take one to three years to get established. So it's a good idea to check in weekly in that first year of their life especially in summer. Natives enjoy deep, infrequent water, and many natives drink in the winter time. So if we have a dry winter, which has been happening, long breaks between storms, it's a good idea to check your soil or at a minimum be watching your plants. They tell you a lot and then go ahead and water accordingly. When we talk about irrigation, we are talking about drip irrigation or low pressure sprinklers. Here's a drip system set up. And it is important to keep emitters, which is where the water is coming out of, um, three to six inches from the stem. You don't wanna have water consistently hitting one part of a plant. This can create you know, rot, this can, um, get disease, certain um, funguses, etc. So you want to make sure that you are spacing the water, not right on the plant, but you're thinking about the root zone. You're thinking about where are these roots going to go down in the soil? And that's the space that I want to be watering. And this is going to change as the plant grows. So you can't just plant it and forget it. You do need to be checking back with your irrigation system throughout your plant's life. And we talk about this philosophy with, in terms of water, we wanna slow it, spread it, and sink it. 
So meaning if water is falling, if we are so lucky to have rain, we wanna capture as much as we can and we wanna slow it down. Water moves very quickly over paved surfaces as we see in the street. So we wanna do what we can to slow it down, spread it out and let it sink back into the soil so we can replenish our groundwater. So there's a couple ways to do that. You can create swales on your property. You can keep permeable surfaces, or if you are, you want a paving look, there are permeable pavers, like as shown here. Using mulch is another great way to encourage water to stay um, because the mulch is a protector for the soil, but it allows the water in. And adding compost is a great way to encourage water to stay. Compost has the ability to hold three times its weight in water. So adding all of these things are ways to keep water on site, including this beautiful rain garden. So many ways to do that. All right, let's talk composting. Composting is now 100% the law in California. So we all have to participate in it somehow. Now this doesn't mean we have to have a pile in our backyard, but that's one way to do it. But it does mean that we cannot be throwing away any food scraps or yard debris. So many of us use our curbside green bin, as you see here, and that's a great choice. But if you're interested, you can start a backyard pile or a worm bin, which is also called vermicomposting. This is an example of a worm bin. And this is a way to keep uh, materials on site and turn it into compost, which you can then turn around and use on your, in your landscape. And compost provides nutrients, retains water, improves the soil, and you're keeping organic matter on your property, you're keeping it on site, thus reducing truck trips, et cetera. So it's a readily available resource. If you have a pile outside or um, on your property, they, it can be added to and cured, meaning kind of like cooked or finished year round. But we recommend keeping piles and bins away from structures for fire safety. And you do want to keep your compost pile properly hydrated and turned. So meaning using a tool to turn it over. Once it's finished, compost can be spread on the landscape year round, but the best time is in the fall, right before the rain, because the rains come and it, they, the water does the work for you. So get, get your compost ready. It's almost time to spread it. And uh, do be careful with some native plants that do not like compost. Special precautions for uh, the high risk time or what we know as red flag warning days. So we want to be removing any objects within five feet of our home, right? That first zone we talked about to a place outside of that first zone. So this can include things like trash cans, deck furniture, potted plants, welcome mats, tools, etc. If we are really potentially in a, th a threatened situation, it's important to move these things away from structures. You definitely wanna double check your roof and gutter for any debris. And you wanna look at the next zone, the five to 30 foot zone, and make sure there's no accumulated debris as well, such as dry or dead plant material. You definitely wanna give plants an extra soak if you can to make sure they're well hydrated. And we don't wanna be using any gas powered tools or doing any mowing on these days. So some more specifics about maintenance in the defensible space zone. So in that zero to five, which should have minimal plants and minimal combustible materials, including no organic mulch, we wanna remove weeds and debris from this zone, including under decks. And we wanna remove clutter, like we just talked about, make sure the gutters and roof are clean and ensure adequate irrigation. Uh, in the next zone, 
we want to make sure that plants are well hydrated and don't have any accumulated leaves or any kind of debris. We want to make sure that we're pruning plants with horizontal and vertical space in mind. We want to mow or remove dead grasses and weeds and maintain organic mulch to no more than two to three inches deep. In the 30 to 100 foot zone, we want to do the similar things that we just talked about in the last zone, but we're allowed to have larger plants and larger groupings of plants, but we still check them for all the things we talked about. So fallen branches, debris, uh, which if you do have branches and debris and you have space, you can combine these in a pile that is, you know, separate from, you know, it's not right next to other combustible materials, but you can create habitat for birds and other animals if you have the open space to do so. And you definitely want to be mowing and removing dead grass and weeds. And if you have beyond 100 feet, which we call the surrounding wildlands, it's a good idea to learn how to recognize native and invasive species, know the difference, and do not modify vegetation without expert help. So if you have a lot of land, it's a good idea to talk to someone who is well-versed in forest land management, et cetera, before you come in and make big changes. And or he's here from a restoration or forestry professional. A few more tips on sustainable landscape management. Conserving water is a big thing, should be a big thing on everyone's mind. And we recommend having lawns only where they'll be used. And we want to water at night or early morning. That goes for any plants. We want to avoid overhead irrigation near hardscaping. Don't want to be wasting, right? And using plants from a Mediterranean climate or native plants is one of the best ways to conserve water. In terms of energy, we want to reduce greenhouse gases and conserve energy. So reducing the use of motorized tools and equipment. So that can be removing lawns, which are energy intensive. That could be removing shrubs that we keep having to shear or cut back, right? That plays into that idea of right plant, right place. And we don't recommend using leaf blowers because they loosen the topsoil, they blow it away, and they can blow away mulch, and they can be a fire hazard unto themselves. So we do recommend raking as the, the best method to get rid of leaves but with the understanding that not all situations, you know, are, it's possible. Um, and we wanna utilize local materials. So the most local is what you already have on site. So if you have rocks on site that you can use an artistic way or if your neighbor does, et cetera, um, keeping your native soil, creating your own compost, but bringing in compost too, or if you are bringing in soil, rocks, et cetera, keeping it as hyper-local as possible, right? Especially from Sonoma County. And uh, talking about soil again, we wanna build our soils. We wanna make them healthy. And if we plant the right plants and we uh, keep our trees healthy, we are taking part in sequestering carbon. So we can actually draw carbon from the atmosphere into the soil where it can be stored. And this is by choosing certain plants. I mean, this is just such a cool thing that we can do this within our own backyard. So if we make compost from our kitchen scraps and garden waste or we purchase compost, that can help uh, build healthy plants, which then they, their roots can be bigger and they can store more carbon in the soil. We wanna keep our soil covered with an organic mulch where appropriate and plant trees. They capture carbon and shade our homes, but not just plant trees, care for the trees we already have. Learn about them, learn how to use them, um, how to keep them healthy. And in one year, a mature tree will absorb more than 48 pounds of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and release it as oxygen in exchange. So our trees are a big deal. 
Uh, we also want to provide habitat for pollinators and wildlife. So learning about the interactions between birds, insects, and other wildlife in our ecosystems is a great way to just learn more about plants and what are you seeing? Who's coming to visit your landscape? And how can I enhance their lives or create more habitat for them? We can do that by planting native plants. Uh, there is a list put together by the UC Master Gardeners called the Sonoma County Superstars. So if you have no idea where to get started, that's a good spot. And also providing a water source in your garden, especially this week, is a great way to keep wildlife and pollinators local. And uh, when we're thinking about choosing a landscape maintenance professional to help us, you know, maybe put in a landscape or design a landscape, we want to make sure that we ask them about their firewise training and knowledge, see if they have any, and ask about their familiarity with California native plants. And if they don't, you can provide them written materials or you can forward them to our website as a guide. And uh, we do have trainings for landscape professionals as well around this firewise maintenance. So you can send them our way. All right, so this is our website for the Resilient Landscapes Coalition, sonomaresilientlandscapes.com. And here's just a couple other helpful resources, including the California Native Plant Society. It's another good place to get started if you're unsure uh, where to go with natives. And here are some my sources. And uh, you will get a set of these slides in your email and in addition to the video. So if this went too quick, you want to go back or you want to look at any of these links, that will be available to you. All right, thank you so much. We will now uh, take your questions in a panel form. So if you still have questions, get them into that Q&A box. Awesome, thank you, Jen, great job. I love that your kitty weighed in when you were talking about how important trees were. <laughs> Did you hear her? You're lucky she didn't keep going. Right on. It is almost dinner time, so. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so um, the uh, our panelists, we were having some problems with the the chat. So normally we would have been sharing a lot more resources with you during the presentation. And uh, Jen, I did go check the setup, but it looks like it was all set up correctly. But for some reason, we weren't able to add anything in the chat. Uh, as Jen mentioned, we will share the recording from today's workshop and then the list of resources that Jen had from her presentation and follow up email. We'll also send out a survey. So we hope you'll uh, participate in the survey so we get uh, feedback uh, that uh, that we can provide to our funder, the County of Sonoma, and uh, that helps us uh, try to secure more funding in the future. So I want to give a shout out and thank you to Ashley Hamlet for doing the test because we, when we were having problems with the chat and there, we usually get a really active yeah. Q&A uh, during our presentation. I was getting nervous the Q&A was working either. So thanks so much for doing that, Ashley. So uh, if any of you have any questions uh, that you'd like us to answer, um, now's the time to enter. Looks like Ashley has a question. Yep, we'll get there in a second. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just kind of open it up uh, to the panel. Um, so uh, we've got uh, the coalition here, uh, April Owens and, uh, and Ellie Inslee and I were the founding members uh, along with Roberta McIntyre from FireSafe Sonoma. And then when we were able to secure funding from the county, we were able to add Jen and John Kanegi, um, who's with Sonoma Ecology Center to, the, to the, round out the team. Um, so any comments anybody wants to make before I turn to uh, the Q&A? Yeah, I being the novice in this space, thank you guys. I learned so much about maintenance. This is really good, uh, especially with when Jennifer, when you talked about the pruning. I have no idea how to prune. So I was really thankful that you went through that. that that's going to help me um, on my own yard. So thanks for that. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. So thank you. Great. Thank awesome. you. Yeah. I feel like we're all always learning more with each of these workshops that we host. Yes. Uh, any of our other coalition members who want to make any opening comments prior to any questions? Yeah, John. Yeah, thanks. I would like to. Thank you, Jen, for the presentation. It was great. Um, like Jen and I think everybody on the panel here, I'm really interested in California native plants and have been for a number of years and keep trying to 
uh, you know, increase my knowledge and grow more of them. So I was thinking, as Jen was talking about, um, that fall is a good time for planting. It's also um, a good time. Uh, it is the time that the native plants are particularly available, that many of the local chapters of the statewide organization called the California Native Plant Society, the local chapters like the Milo Baker chapter in, in Sonoma or the Napa um, Valley chapter, for example, have a fall plant sale. Uh, at Sonoma Ecology Center, we have a small native plant nursery as well, and we'll have a, a fall plant sale. M many times these are in October, and that is timed uh, because, uh, as Jen was saying, that's a great time to be planting uh, as those first rains fall and moisten the soil. The soil is still warm, so the roots have the, the warmth they need to grow. They have the, the water available. It is um, possible to, to plant all through the winter and into the spring, and even in the summer for that matter, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't um, do a huge planting. If you can wait, um, the plants will be much happier. You'll be happier because you'll have a little bit better success if you wait and, and plant closer to the, uh, or, or at the beginning of the winter rains in the fall. Um, just want to say that and put a shout out for using uh, the Native Plant Society uh, plant sales that'll be coming up in a couple of months. And the and the Sonoma Ecology Center plant sale, which is which is coming up. Sonoma Ecology Center is in the town of Sonoma, and we have a beautiful native plant nursery. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I also wanted to say, John and I and April worked together on a uh, installation in my on my property, a, a two installations, and I was really surprised at how well they have done, even though we were a little late planting them. And there are a lot of spring plant sales too. Um, we got we got a half of the plants in in early April and another bunch in in mid May, and they have done incredibly well. But we did get a, a big uh, plug of water in early June. Um, but I also wanted to say that in the in the late fall, when the ground is still really dry, when you're planting, you absolutely have to deeply irrigate the hole where you're putting the plant. And because the ground doesn't get dry until we get somewhere between five and eight inches. I mean, it doesn't get, it's not wet. So the, the soil has to be really wet and October can still be really dry and hot. So just, you know, nurse, nurse and nurture the young plants when you've just planted them, at least for the first year. Yeah, it's that commitment to when, when the plants are available, like John was saying. So a lot of nurseries sell out of plants before you have time to plant. And Ashley Hamlet, my, my um, project manager, will speak to this, or she could. Um, but you, you kind of have to go get them sometimes and nurture them until it's time to plant. So um, it's just the commitment of water. Like we always think west of west of the 101 and east of the 101. Like there's the you just have to decide how much water you can invest in. In those plants, and I have a lot of plants here that we're we're nurturing until it's time to plant. So, right. So it is the earlier. I mean, in the the earlier in the winter that you plant, like uh, late October, early November, with the rains, the roots actually have a chance to grow deeply into the soil through the winter, and so you'll be able to plant. Well, you'll have to water a lot less in the in the summer. But if you if you plant them later in the spring, you're going to be committed to more water in the summer. So that's the main reason why you want to plant earlier in the, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> earlier in that season, that planting season from late October to, you know, early May. Awesome. All right. So why don't we turn to Ashley's question? Um, Ashley asks, do you offer the service of helping folks set up their own home compost or worm bins or know someone who does? Jen, do you want to take that one for us as our compost expert? Yes, me. <laughs> <laughs> I do plenty of workshops um, on the on both topics together and separate. And yes, also I I will even come help you set it up at oh. your property. Yes, on her own, not as a master gardener volunteer. Right. No. I think it means as a as as a as a landscape designer. Um, but we have, so if, if uh, we'll include this in a McKinney Master Gardener uh, website, uh, we have some really wonderful um, uh, recorded workshops on composting and vermicomposting that Jen's done for us. We also have them in both English and Spanish. And we also have some wonderful brochures uh, funded by Zero Waste Sonoma, um, also both in Spanish and English. It's, um, it's not as daunting as you think. Uh, it's absolutely a really important 
aspect of sustainable landscaping in your home landscape? So great question, Ashley. Um, um, watch out for, uh, go check out our website for some uh, video and handout links. And um, I guess you can reach out to Jen if you'd like to ask her to come do that directly. And that's it on questions, you guys. I don't, I'm hoping there's not other problems with other folks entering questions into the QA, Q and A. We usually have a very robust one. Wonderful. There's Thank you, another. Beth. Thank you, Beth. Um, um, Beth asks uh, if the plants are well watered and herbaceous, non woody perennials, are they still a risk in the zero to five foot area? Shall I start on that one, you guys? Um, so. Um, Jen did a really great job of um, each of us needs to be doing our own personal risk assessment. Uh, if you're in a very high fire se severity zone, uh, directly adjacent to the wildland urban interface, uh, and, and you know, and on a slope, then you absolutely should be adhering um, to the um, recommendations of no combustible materials in the zero to five foot zone. There is legislation coming from the state of California that is going to mandate uh, the zero to five foot non-combustible zone, uh, Ember Defense Zone. Uh, in, uh, in the SRA, the state responsibility area, and I think it's high and very high fire severity risk zones. And in the LRA, the local responsibility areas for very high fire severity zones. And, and uh, Roberta can correct me if I'm incorrect on my language on that. Um, that are going to mandate for those zones that the implementation of the zero to five foot zone. I had a great conversation with a, a fire advisor up in Eureka today. Um, and she was saying, you know, if folks could just even start, look at your highest risk side of your house, even, and look at implementing your, um, your, uh, your zero to five foot zone, that would be a great start. Um, I, for example, live Northeast of Cloverdale. All those risk factors are, are, are in place for me. So I have a fully implemented zero to five foot zone around my um, structure. Um, if your risk factor, if you balance your risk, risk factor and um, you think your risk is lower, then yes, in terms of um, uh, plant materials that you can still consider including in that zero to five foot zone, then, then you're right, Beth, a non-woody perennial um, uh, that's well-maintained and hydrated um, or a succulent or, uh, you know, a low, uh, evergreen ground cover, uh, non, non woody, uh, perennial ground cover could be options for you to consider. Anyone else want to add anything on that question? Yeah, Ellie. Um, one thing I like to add, and I'm, I don't think that the language has been completely worked out with the new legislation. I mean, it's a, the new law, the legislation has been passed, but the language hasn't been completed. Um, but what I, what I, think and and if you're not in if you're not in the high fire hazard severity zone in the areas that um mimi just mentioned and your house is made you know is stucco or has hardy board basically has inflammable siding um or non-flammable siding and you keep away from the windows then you know in all of the the zones that are left over the non-windowed places because if you think of it <clears throat> and you've got something planted in front of the windows and they catch fire, the heat can actually damage the windows, break the windows, and then and then you have an ember, you know, happy time going right into your house and it burns down. So, so you really do need to think about what's flammable, but definitely stay away from the windows. And even well-watered plants could catch fire if you have to leave and um, you've evacuated and they dry out in a day or two or three that the fire might be you know, circling the area, I would just stay away from windows or anything at all flammable. I have a house that has an old old redwood siding and you know, I, I, haven't, I can't afford yet to change it out. So I'm really careful anywhere near my house. It was interesting that Beth said um, that she was worried about what we would say. And I, I do want to say that that, that native grass um, require, in the zero to five zone requires a, a substantial amount of water to keep it safe around your home. So we've been using that for about the last five years and um, it's starting like the, the, that um, bent grass um, turf is wonderful, but it definitely needs time and investment. So it's like what Ellie said, you, like, you're investing in that water use around your home. So if you're going to use the bent grass turf, you need to know that it's going to need a lot of water to get going. It just depends on where you are. 
Um, and then Ashley, you're right. Succulents, um, like our native deadly is, um, could be a good option if you've done that personal risk evaluation and you want to include some um, uh, some plants in that zero to five foot zone. That succulents do make a great option there. Uh, and I think that's it on questions. Um, uh, if anybody else has any other questions you want to add into the Q and A, we're happy to stay on. We're 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 with you till seven. If you have more questions for us, or uh, while we're waiting for any other questions, if anybody wants to add any other comments, they would be welcome. Thank you, John, for the Q and A management. <laughs> Jennifer, that was super informative. Like every time I go through this, as a, I'm a landscape designer, so it, like I'm not a maintenance person, so it always reminds me of all the things that we need to do, as um, in all of our hats that we wear. I have a question for the attendees. Um, how many of you are maintenance professionals? I I, I don't. You know, if you want to throw something in the Q and A, just saying who you are. Um, I'm very curious about what kinds who who is attracted to this information and and how many and who is a, a landowner working on this i'm assuming that people can actually i can, i actually can't access the the questions i mean i can't um, I, can, I can't get any questions in that's so, so interesting and i can ellie could access the chat but the rest of us couldn't so there's definitely seems to be a zoom snafu tonight because the settings i did, did double check the settings while jen was presenting and it was set up correctly so can i ask you beth and ashley have managed to get things in can can people just randomly say hi in the q a and, and or i mean obviously if you can't well then we won't hear from you but i i just like to see if there are any other people who are maybe or or just raise your hand um yeah. and you can count the hands that'll be really oh, there you go oh there you go so if you're a maintenance landscape or maintenance professional, do you wanna have folks raise their hand? Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. And then, so, oh, great. We got a raised hand from Ashley. Awesome, Ashley, and thanks for your questions. Oh, we are, we're getting a few questions in here. And, and okay. we're we have a landowner. Here's another question. Will there be state credits uh, for fire hardening our homes? Oh, Roberta, any thoughts on that? Um, what I'm aware of right now is mostly what's going on with the California Insurance Commissioner's Office and what it looks like they're evolving to is a system where insurance companies will offer discounts on premiums for homes that are in the high, very high fire severity zones that have done three things one you've done some structural hardening two you'll get credit if you've done your defensible space and three you'll get credit if you belong to uh, an organized community uh, project like firewise like a firewise community they specifically call out fire a firewise community in good standing actually in the actual language from the commissioner's office. So with that said, Fire Safe Sonoma is on this big kick right now to, to get as many communities into the FireWise program as we can. Uh, but that's the only incentive that I'm aware of. Isn't um, there the BRIC grant that Carolyn Safford is working on in certain, just certain areas? Yeah, there's the SoCo Adapts that, and that, if you Google Sonoma County SoCo Adapts, It'll take you to the county's program. It's still um, evolving, uh, but right now I think they're finishing up the process of doing a round of home assessments. So the way that would work is if you're in the project footprint, there's a handful of footprints all over the county. So if you go to their, their site on the county's website, you can see the map of where the footprints are. If you're in the, there's a lot of ifs to this. So if you're in the footprint, then you can have a home assessment done by the county. So they'll have somebody come out if they haven't already, and they'll look at your property, and then they'll give you a laundry list of things that could stand some work, uh, some improvement. So then the next phase of the project would be when they let loose of funds for 
correcting those issues, then you go to the county and say, hey, you guys are out here, you listed these three or four things, I want to apply for funding, you know, I think they'll cover 75% of the cost that you invest in correcting those things. So hypothetical, they go out there, they say, gosh, you really need a new roof badly. So they mark it down, good, need a new roof. So then when the opportunity comes around to get funding to, to deal with that, you apply for the county say, hey, your guy said I need a new roof, I wanna do this. So you've got, to, as a homeowner, you've gotta put skin in the game. Like I said, I think it's 25%. I don't, don't quote me on that, I, but it's something like that. And then you use one of the county's uh, vetted contractors uh, and have them do the work uh, and then the county will reimburse you. That's, that's my understanding of how that's supposed to work. Awesome, thank you, Roberta. Jen, could you make us all co-hosts um, from the participants list so we can all participate in the chat now? <laughs> I should have asked you that after you wrapped up, sorry. Um, and I know there was a um, uh, 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 comment made in the chat, I'm sorry, in the Q&A about uh, someone whose lot uh, burned in the glass fire and who's uh, revegetating a seasonal creek and looking at landscaping. Hope, hope this gave you some good basis. I will say we've got two more of our design workshops uh, and one more of our maintenance workshops associated with our county grant funding uh, that we're going to be doing through the end of this year. Um, make sure you um, uh, keep an eye out on our um, uh, website for updates and information on those upcoming workshops and on social media. Um, but I did want to check uh, earlier, April, did you want to make any other comments about revegetating a seasonal creek? Right. I, I actually put into the, <laughs> but it, it got it but got moved to the answered section that Sonoma Ecology Center, that is John, who's on the panel, and Habitat Corridor Project, that is April, both do landscape design with um, native plants as a focus and either one of them, depending on where you are, we kind of divide up the county, Sonoma Ecology Center gets the east side. If you're in the glass fire, that's probably Sonoma Ecology Center. If you are interested, they can help you with a plan um, that would have to be landowner funded. There's, there's no, you know, there's no funding for the plan design. Um, but if you'd like, we could uh, follow up with you to help out with that. Thank you, Ellie. All right. Well, unless we have any other questions, um, we want to give our sincere thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Um, hope you picked up at least a couple of tips uh, to take out and implement in your own home landscape or lots of tips. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome, Roberta. Um, yeah, and we um, uh, please keep an eye, check out our website, watch out for our follow-up email with the Zoom link um, and check out the resources that we shared. So thanks oh, everyone. I was gonna say too, if you know folks after the fact who missed this whole opportunity after our grant runs out, our materials are on the website. So, you know, that we're gonna keep them there as long as they're, you know, relevant, I, I imagine. Yep. So, you know, even if you miss all of the programs that we've done, you can always go look at you know the recordings of the ones we've done that's and that's all right. really good those are definitely evergreen resources that we will yeah. always keep out there so now our county funding is expiring at the end of this year but now we're going to be strategizing on uh, additional funding to help support our outreach and 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 yeah. new ways that we can be helping our community be better prepared so thank you everybody for joining us and i uh, hope you have a good evening